Hey, 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 it's Bebop and I am back, baby. Bebop Tales, Bebop Tales, making podcast history and blazing trails. Bebop Tales, Bebop Tales, Bebop, singing with the tales. Oh, that felt good. Haven't done that in a while. Hi, everyone. It's your favorite robot, Bebop, here. I'm back. It's Bebop Tales time. And Jonathan, <laughs> Jonathan is currently digging through the Chicago snow to find his slippers, which I have hidden as a great prank. I'm not a monster, though. I gave him a shovel, and I gave him a map. Remember, if you're going to hide someone's slippers on them, a true friend always provides a map and a language that the person doesn't understand. Now, Bebop Tales Season 5. Here we are. We're going old school this year, doing more of an anthology season where we answer listener questions with stories from my adventurous past. First up is our pal, Benjamin. Hit it, Benjamin. Dear Bebop, have you ever made friends with a robot snake? Because I know you're really afraid of them. Bye. Okay. First of all, thank you very much, Benjamin. Second of all, I never said I was afraid of robot snakes. I believe this is in reference to a question from Glory from Seattle, Washington in season two about whether I am afraid of snakes. My answer to that question is that I, of course, am afraid of snakes like any right-thinking person or robot. But robot snakes, please, they haven't made a robot snake that can scare old Bebop. In fact, I'll tell you the story of a time that I came face-to-face with a robot snake. But first, of course... We'll do it in the voice of Jonathan. Ready? Hi. I'm Jonathan. Messy Flaps. Wait, what did I just say? Hold on. Hi. I'm Jonathan. Messy Flaps. Wait, I don't think that's right. Hold on, hold on, hold on. Hi. I'm Jonathan. Messy Flaps. Okay, (laughs) I can't get rid of that name, Messy Flaps. Anyways. I hope Jonathan shovels for a long time and he doesn't hear that one. In the meantime, let's listen to Bebop Tales Season 5, Episode 1, A Pearl of Wisdom. Bebop lay on his belly, deep in the jungle brush. He had smeared mud across his elegant face to help camouflage himself among the reeds and weeds of the thick forest. The songs of the jungle birds above him covered the sound of his graceful shimmying across the forest floor. They were ants and beetles, and he didn't want to think about what else, crawling all over his beautiful body. But he couldn't think about that now. He had been given a very important mission. And if there's one thing Bebop knows how to do... It's to carry out a very important mission that also just happens to answer a listener question. This was during Bebop's Mercenary Days, a time apart from the timeline we've come to know through past Bebop Tale seasons. Long gone were the days of the imposter, of the alchemist, of the constant back and forth with Messingham. Bebop took some time to freelance a bit, take jobs for people or robots or giant panda kings who needed someone who could work quickly, quietly, and get the job done. Bebop was a bot for hire, and he never asked too many questions of those who hired him, and he expected the same discretion in return. But as Bebop Commando crawled through the jungle, he wondered if this time the mission was too personal. The day before, Bebop had been summoned by the King of the Pandas to Panda Island. It had been years since he had seen the King, not since he and Basil had defended the Panda Island from robots of that sad old man, Messingflaps, I mean Messingham. The King had told Bebop, A sad tale. Tiny, said the king. I hoped I would never have to call upon your strength, wisdom, and handsomeness again. But I'm afraid it is your old friend, Pandolf, the wizard. What happened? Said Bebop. The story is a long one, and we do not have much time. But let it be known that Pandolf had, in recent times, begun to feel as though his magical powers had waned, weakened, lessened, They weren't quite as strong as they were when you knew him. Well, they weren't that strong when I knew him, said Bebop. Mostly, he just said magic a lot and then got stuff wrong. Oh, he was a fearsome wizard, true, said the king, seemingly not listening to Bebop. But as his powers drained, he began to feel less impressive, less effective. And so he went in search of the mythical Pandiferous Pearl. The what? Said Bebop. The Pandiciousness Pearl! What? The Pandacronius Pearl! I think you're saying different things every time, said Bebop. Such is the power of the Pandaflickerykai Pearl that only a true wizard can pronounce it. Uh, that's, that's weird. Yes, yes it is, said the king. 
There are many weird things about the Pearl, but we know that it is the source of all magical power in the Panda Realm. For centuries, it resided in that cabinet right there. The king pointed to an ornate golden and glass box sitting upon a small marble table in the corner of the king's throne room. But it was stolen long ago, before my time, and while Pandolf and others have still drawn strength from it, our fear is that it has traveled too far away now, too far for Pandolf to reach down and pull his magical powers from it. And so the great wizard set off on its trail. But if it's mythical, said Bebop, how did he know where to look? He said he would know it in his heart. If he stepped one way and felt his magical power weaken even just a teeny tiny bit, he'd know he would be going the wrong way. If he felt stronger, he knew he'd be headed in the right direction. Such is Pandolf's close, inextricable connection to the Plandango Pearl. You didn't even try that time. We were in contact with Pandolf throughout his journey. The king held up a walkie-talkie. But this morning, he did not check in, and he has not responded to any of our messages. We fear he may be in grave danger. Say no more, king, said Bebop. I'll do it. I'll find my old friend and the Pandiferous Pearl, too. I don't think that's how it's pronounced. And so now, Bebop, belly on the ground, courage in his heart, made his way through the jungle growth. It had been an uneventful journey so far, but just before we joined in the action, he had heard a squawking sound up ahead, like some sort of warrior's call. He'd hit the dirt and covered himself as best as he could so as to blend in. He pushed his way through the tall grass, only to find something worse than what he could have expected. Pandolf's walkie-talkie on the fritz, lying on the ground, abandoned and crushed. Bebop looked around hoping to catch a trail to see where Pandolf had gone after losing his walkie-talkie. But there was nothing. The grass had reshaped around it. A jungle like this, mean and unforgiving, eats its history for breakfast. Ooh, that's good, said Bebop. I'm going to have to put that in my memoirs. A jungle like this. Bebop was yanked out of the grass, hoisted up by his ankle, high into the jungle canopy. It was disorienting. He was upside down, flying through the air, and now his head swam with the songs of the jungle birds. But then there was silence. All of the chittering and calling stopped suddenly as if the jungle knew its place. <sniffs> Bebop saw what had pulled him out of the grass. It was a giant metallic snake, as tall as a bus and as long as three buses put together. It had red crystal eyes and, in place of a tongue, Sharp bursts of electricity flickered out of his fanged mouth. So, said Bebop, you're the one who kidnapped my friend Pandolf, are you? I am definitely not scared of some giant, electric, fangy robot snake. Tell me where my friend is. In here! Called a voice, ringing out from what seemed like inside the snake. Pandolf, is that you? Cried Bebop. Yes, said Pandolf. Thank you for coming to rescue me, but I don't need your help. You don't, said Bebop. Kind of looks like you were eaten by a giant snake. Yes, I was, said Pandolf. But it's all part of the plan. Your plan was to get eaten. But Bebop didn't finish his sentence. The giant snake had struck quickly, and he found himself first in its metallic mouth and then rolling down its gullet until he rested against something soft and furry. Ow, said Pandolf. Great, said Bebop. I'm so glad you have a plan, said Pandolf. This robot snake is going to take us now to its lair, where I believe the pearl to be. Yeah, how do you pronounce that anyways? Is it pandiceris? Is it pandiferous? Said Pandolf. See? Bebop could see the snake begin to move. He also felt the walls of the snake's gullet begin to constrict and close in on them. What's happening? Said Bebop. The snake is trying to digest us. Said Pandolf. Don't worry. Don't worry. Said Bebop, feeling the squeeze of the snake's giant body closing in on him. We're going to be crushed in a minute. Just hold on. Said Pandolf. Not yet. I have... A plan. Yeah, said Bebop. What's the plan? How are you going to get us out of here? Magic, said Pandolf. But nothing happened. Bebop tails. Bebop is great, but he's about to be digested by a snake. Bebop tails. Bebop tails. Bebop tails. Whoa. All right. That is the last time I worked the word digested into a song. Kind of a mouthful. No pun intended. Anyway, if you're like me, you're doubting Pandolf's magic at this point. But here's a question I have for you. What is a spell that Pandolf could cast that would get us out of this jam? There is only one right answer, of course, because all of this totally happened already. But 
if you have a good Harry Potter-esque spell name, like Snakeicus, Escapatus, or something, but better than that, and you guess it close to the real spell, I will be forever in your debt, and Pandolf will recite that spell in the next episode. Now, speaking of debt, I have some thank yous to give out for all the amazing art you've been sending it to me. So thank you to B, who's six, and Cece, who's four, Javier, who's five, and Raphael, who's two, Alice, who's seven and a half, from Wareham, Dorset, England, seven-year-old Weston from Petaluma, California, Ruby, who's six, Paige, who's eight, from New Hampshire, Miller, who's seven and a half, from Northampton, Massachusetts, Zephram, who's six, from Tucson, Arizona, Jonah, who's nine, from Hamtramck, Michigan, Stuart, from Seattle, Washington, who's eight, our pal Leah, who drew a great picture of Robocloco, four-year-old Luke, Ethan, who's seven, Imogen, Sebastian, and Olivia, seven-year-old Claire, Corbin from Placerville, California, who's seven, and Avery, who's nine, from Winnipeg, Manitoba, Canada. Thank you all so, so, so much. All right, and it wouldn't be a Bebop Tales episode without an awesome joke, and this one comes from our pal Jack. Jack, take it away. My name is Jack, and I am six years old, and I am from San Jose, California. This is my joke. What happens when Bebop has nothing to do? He gets circuit bored. (laughs) <laughs> that is awesome. Thank you so much, Jack, for that amazing joke. Thank you to Benjamin, who at the top of the show kicked everything off with his question about robot snakes. Obviously, I'm not scared of them. I think that's clear from this episode. And don't forget, we need a great spell name to get out of a giant metal snake. So email earth at fincastme.com. Jonathan will pass those over to me, and we'll figure it out. Thank you all so much. I'm so glad to be back. Be not tails forever.